live. It's thinking about live. Are we live? It says we're live. Hello. Hello from Frogholt. Welcome to everyone. We'll let the folks uh, filter in. We're starting on time. We've already got five, it says, and I'm sure more will be joining us. As you join, you're here, by the way, if you're not sure where you are, you're on the Squirrel Squadron, and you're here for the event on uh, d testing on your customers. Don't test until it's live. Uh, if you wanted to be somewhere else, if you wanted to watch Minecraft, th this isn't the place to be. Um, so if you're here for the right thing, then I'm going to ask you to comment. Uh, this is interactive, or as much as I can manage uh, with this uh, streaming software. Um, so please comment with who you are, because um, this uh, doesn't always tell me whose people's names are. So give your name. Your just first name is fine, but just tell me what to call you. And I want your worst bug story. So as people are arriving, I'm going to tell a, a terrible bug story, how awful the bug was. Um, what's the best, worst bug you encountered? It could be you were the victim of the bug. You know, you were trying to book your flight and, uh, you know, it got canceled at the last second because of a bug, wouldn't accept your surname or something like that. Um, I've had people have that situation, believe me. Um, it could be that you were the, the um, um, perpetrator of the bug. <laughs> you, you wrote the software that caused the bug to happen. That would be interesting, too. What's the worst bug you've encountered? And what I'm going to try to do for those uh, bugs is uh, describe how we would test those on customers. So you might think the solution to having bugs is more testing before you release the software. That would be the obvious thing to think, and that's I'm going to argue the opposite today. So that's where we are. Please comment in the chat, whatever system you're on. Um, let me know what is your worst bug. What's your worst bug example? Fantastic. So uh, let me just say a little bit more about where we are while people are arriving. This is the Squirrel Squadron. This is my group of uh, tech and non-tech executives, and we're all learning from each other. So um, this is going to be a successful stream. We had a wonderful one two weeks ago where people bugged me with all kinds of questions, argued, debated. That's the way we do it here at the Squadron. So uh, let's do another of those. Uh, tell me what your questions are. Tell me if you tried to test on your customers, if you think it's the dumbest idea ever. Uh, that's the best thing. Um, um, in the squadron, we do these uh, weekly events. They're all free. Uh, I never have anything to sell. That's not what I'm about. Uh, this is my way of giving back. So uh, we have these weekly events. We have a forum where people are debating and discussing. I was asking about uh, worst bug examples there, and we'll have more discussion as we go on uh, about all these topics there on the forum. So uh, feel free to bounce on over there. You can find out about all this stuff at squirrelsquadron.com, and I'll say more about it later. I do want to say we have some exciting events coming up and um, absolutely new hot off the press news. Um, the first uh, couple of events are already on the website. That's um, estimates are lies. So that's going to be a uh, live stream in a couple of weeks. So if you're interested in not estimating anymore, a lot of engineers find that frustrating. Or if you don't believe your engineers when they estimate, um, I'll, I'll be talking about uh, why you shouldn't believe them and what else you can do. And uh, next week, we're doing a Zoom on uh, winning with ambiguity, why it's great to get requirements that don't make any sense, and why when somebody gives you a strategy that you can't make sense of, that's actually great news and should make you very happy. Um, fantastic. So we have some comments coming through. Great. I will come to those. Thank you very much. Do remember to include your name, because unfortunately, the software I'm using, maybe it's a bug. I don't know. They're testing on me, um, but it doesn't always show me your name. So I have something here from LinkedIn user. I don't know who that is. So stick your name in, just say Dave or George or A or, um, you know, give yourself a nice pseudonym. I always tell them at Starbucks, I always tell them my name is Spider-Man. Um, and they deliver a, uh, a, a cup of coffee with Spider-Man written on it. It works great. So if you want to be Spider-Man, that's great. Just give me a name so I don't have to call you user. That doesn't sound so nice. Okay. Uh, so let me... Uh, oh, and I didn't get to my exciting news. I promised you news. This is literally... Uh, Laura and I were on the phone two hours ago. Um, we're lining up events in Berlin and Vienna and Miami. So um, I've been kind of um, cogitating about those, um, hinting at them for a while. But uh, well, hi, Javier, great to see you. Thank you. Um, I'll come to your topic in a second. Um, so uh, uh, we've been uh, hinting at these, but we're getting them confirmed. So it looks like October the 20th is uh, Vienna. We'll have that up on the website soon. Uh, Berlin is coming in late September, early October. So we're just getting that one lined up. And Miami will be uh, 8th, 9th, 10th of November. So I'm um, traveling around the world, trying to get to see as many of you as I can. So uh, very excited to, to meet uh, more and more of you. It's Praveen, hallelujah, very nice to see you. Wonderful to, to get your questions and comments. I'll come to those very shortly. Um, but let me tell my story first while people are arriving. Um, and uh, this is a story uh, from about 10 years ago at an e-commerce um, uh, uh, platform product that I was uh, a part of. And we had the world's worst spaghetti code. 
if you think developers complain about code where you are, if you find that people say this stuff is very hard to work with, we're, uh, it's terrible, it's awful, you should have seen what we had. And we had the world's worst bug. Or at least we thought it was. Because what happened was, I, I went to this um, page. I was kind of wandering around in this system. We had inherited it. It was written by somebody else. And uh, he made a terrible mess. It worked. We were very happy it worked. But man, was it a mess to, to sell the products that we had. The dog agrees. Um, the, the, uh, and what he would do is create these pages that um, would do stuff. And we didn't know what the pages were. <laughs> They'd be called something like run script 27 or something. And we didn't know what they were for. So I just sat down with one of the developers one day and I said, let's just open all these pages. And some of them printed reports and some of them um, like queried stuff in the database. We said, let's see if any of these are useful and we'll delete the ones that aren't. So we're running through and we're opening these different pages. And we got to number 22 or something and it was blank. We looked at it and we said, this is weird. It's just a blank page. Well, it's not causing us any harm. It's just some extra page. If someone managed to type this URL, they'd get to this page. Who cares? So we went on to number 23 and we just kept going. And suddenly there was this kind of rumble from the customer service people. They were they were sitting right next to us. And there's kind of rumble. And they said, yeah, what's happening? What's happening? And, you know, that kind of buzz you get when when something is happening. It just kind of rumble. It got louder and louder. And, and eventually somebody started saying, one pound Louis Vuitton handbags. And that made us very interested because we sold uh, pre-owned, pre-loved Louis Vuitton handbags. If, as I didn't, you don't know what that is, that's an extremely high-end um, handbag. For some reason, it's worth thousands and thousands of pounds. And we were selling them for quite a lot of money, a lot less than you'd buy from the original uh, seller. But these were ones that had been bought and had been resold, had been sold to us so that we could send them as, sell them as secondhand, like a second, uh, a used car, uh, except it was a handbag. And somebody said they're, they're being sold for one pound. And we thought, first of all, this was a marketing ploy. And we thought, oh, this is some new sale they're going to do. And then they came over to us and they said, we've just sold five or 10 Louis Vuitton handbags for one pound. And we didn't mean to. And that made my heart sink. And <laughs> the, the, um, the uh, uh, CFO started marching over and I could hear his, fit, his feet making the, the floor bounce um, because uh, he, he was you know, really worried that we were going to go bankrupt if we kept selling these. So um, we went and, of course, there was a connection between this blank page and suddenly selling things for one pound. What happened was when the guy who wrote the system originally wrote it, we didn't sell anything for more than a thousand pounds. And some of you who are engineers will start to, your gears will be turning. You will have figured this out. What happened was uh, he, he was uh, uh, building this script, but he didn't take into account there could be commas. So between the one and the zero, 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 or the two and the nine, nine, five, or whatever it was, there's a comma. And in, on the continent, of course, they put full stops. But whatever they do, there's a separator. He didn't take account of that. So his script, which ran when we opened this blank page, it actually did something we didn't know. What it did is went through the whole database and it updated all the prices. And it updated all these ones for 1,995 pounds to one pound. Very mysterious fact occurred, just complete coincidence. We were suddenly out of stock of Louis Vuitton handbags right then, and we didn't fulfill any of those orders. Wonder, wonder how that happened. So, um, and of course, we went through and, and uh, figured out all well, the ones we messed up, and we fixed them very, very quickly. And that, that got our attention. That was, that was an exciting afternoon, I can tell you. Here's the silver lining to that before I come to why it was great that that happened. Yes, this was actually great news, but it was great news for a kind of funny reason, which I should tell you, um, a tangent to our topic today. And that is the marketing department actually loved it. And they said, this is the greatest thing ever. We should tell everybody about this. This is so great because you can buy Louis Vuitton handbags for one pound on our, on our website. We should tell everyone. And they actually made us build a feature. And the feature was so that the marketing department could pick one place one time each day. So every day there'd be one place, a secret location on our site where you could buy Louis Vuitton or whatever it was, some other fancy designer for one pound. And of course, they then marketed it. They said, hey, you know, come to our site. And if you search around enough and you're the lucky person, you'll get the thing for one pound. And we actually sold things for one pound. But of course, it got us lots of press and excitement. So there, there was some advantage <laughs> to having had this bug. But that's not the point of, of my story today. The point of my story today is that there's absolutely something wonderful about that, uh, about that bug. There's something that's great, not just the marketing department managed to, uh, to, to kind of put it back together. But that is that we heard that rumbling from customer service. And that wasn't by accident. 
So I made sure that the tech team, we had this great big, large, open kind of football pitch sized um, uh, location we were in. And I made sure that we were sitting right next to the customer service people. That was on purpose. And that was so that when we released our software, we would hear from the customer service people when there was a problem. We could literally hear them, right? We'd hear the rumble or they'd shout over to us, hey, something, bro, you took the site down, it was broken. Because we did that a lot. We did not have any automated tests and we didn't build any which will be surprising to those of you who know me and know I'm a big fan of test-driven development and building a lot of tests and continuous deployment and all these great things that involve a lot of testing. I think that's great. We didn't do it in this case. And the reason was we could respond really fast. So remember in the story, I said, I heard the rumble and immediately we got in, we started fixing it. Normally what we'd do is we'd release the software. Here, we didn't know we'd done something. We opened this crazy page. But um, normally what we do is release the software and then listen. And not infrequently, what we'd hear was nobody can log in, or the site is down, or uh, you know people whose names start with Q can't get to. But we'd hear something, or they'd shout to us. They knew that we were right there, and we had a giant red button. So I don't have a visual here with you. I wish I had a red button to show you, but just imagine, you know, that kind of the uh, the one that says press me to launch the nuclear weapons or to uh, you know save the world or to stop the the factory. That kind of scary red button. We had one. It was on the screen, but it was it was the same kind of thing. And when we pressed it, it took the website back to how it was before we made our change. And because we had that, we could respond really fast to what customer feedback we got. And some of the, of course, the customer feedback was, oh my God, this is great, two for one on socks or whatever it was that we'd done. And they said, this is wonderful, great. And you know, sales are up, we're happy. And of course we didn't press the red button. Then we were excited. We said, hallelujah, you know, great success for us. And that the number of times we had that response was many more than the number of bugs, even though we had this terrible system, full of spaghetti, really hard to maintain, terrible setup. And um, if we could do it in that circumstance, my challenge to you is why couldn't you do it in yours? Now, if any of you are building a nuclear plant, please don't do this. This probably will not work out very well for you. We don't need more Chernobyls and, uh, and uh, Three Mile Islands. So, okay. If you're doing something like that, don't build your self-driving car that you know I'm going to climb in and drive down the street. Don't don't do it with that. Most of you are building things that are like websites that sell Louis Vuitton handbags, and therefore the consequence of a bug is low enough that you can recover from it. And if uh, if recovery is fast, that's my first lesson for the day. If recovery is fast, almost all bugs are forgivable. And that's a, a crucial idea that can really really help you to avoid the cost of testing, to avoid the slowdown even more than the cost in terms of people and, and, and effort, the most important one is how slow is your feedback loop. And I'm going to talk more about that in the OODA loop and things like that soon. But, but let me come to comments because we have a whole bunch of good ones from interesting folks who have given us their names. Fantastic. Always put your name in just so I make sure I know who it is. So we've got Javier, Praveen, Jez, uh, Chris. Wonderful to see all of you. Fantastic. Um, so uh, let's see. Javier says, uh, recommendations and practices for B2B software. Hold me to that, Javier. Remind me if I don't get back to that. This, of course, is B2C software, right? We're selling handbags not to corporate buyers, but to individuals who want to buy handbags. But this works just as well in those circumstances. Um, I have a reasonable example of that that should come up later, actually from the world of biotech, believe it or not. So Javier, um, hold me to it. Remind me. Don't let me finish the stream without uh, um, bringing you at least one story related to B2B. Uh, Praveen, wonderful to see you. Uh, got another couple folks. Excellent. Good comments coming through. I may not get to all of these. I may go on to the next topic, but let me see where I can get to. Praveen says, the worst bug he ever had was caused by me in updating a script that sent trading info for a bank. Boy, we can see where this one's going, right? This is going to be dangerous. And by the way, Javier, this will be B2B, it sounds like. Bank sending trading info sounds like uh, not going to be to the ordinary consumer. Uh, the bug caused the bank's global currency trading positions to be thrown off by billions of dollars and shut down all currency trading at the bank for a day. Okay, so Praveen's given us a perfect example of a high consequence bug, right? So this is a bug unlike, hey, we have the wrong price on the website and then suddenly we're out of stock of those items so we don't have to send them, right? There's a recovery that's pretty quick and, and relatively painless to high consequence. Bank is shut down for a day. That seems bad. Let, let, let's, let's not shut down the bank for a day. However, there's still lots you can do to test on your customers. So for example, um, in, in this case, let's see. So he's updating uh, trading positions. 
So he's showing the current trading position, obviously he's showing the wrong ones. So the bank says, hey, wait, I don't know if we have, you know, a whole lot of drachmas or not so many euros or something, so they can't trade. But what you could do in that case is to um, show a, um, a, a the current version plus kind of the new version. For example, you could show them side by side. You could give people access to a section in which they say, you say, well, don't actually trade from here. You could make it read only, but here's the current positions according to the new software, according to the new wonderful, fantastic user interface, whatever uh, Praveen was trying to do in updating his script. Now that's more effort. I agree. And that might not be worth it in the bank's case. The might, bank might say, well, it's fine if we're slow in getting feedback. We don't care that much. Um, it's not that important. Usually I find, however, that banks, especially currency traders, are interested in being really reactive to the market. And if there's some new market opportunity, they're really happy to see a read-only version that shows them what they will be getting and they can give feedback on it. We did this once with um, uh, a, a company that had one of these. Um, if you've worked in banking, you'll know the kind of thing I mean. The, the Excel spreadsheet from hell, right? And uh, you keep scrolling to the right and you just go to the right and you go to the right. You get to column XXQ and you didn't know that Excel could go that far. It was one of those. And we found, of course, errors in cell, you know, YY 297 that had been there for years and were causing them to report the wrong things. What we did for them actually was to create a completely fake version uh, inside software, right? Not a um, uh, Excel spreadsheet, but a completely fake version of the data they wanted to see. And we told them all these numbers are wrong. We've cut and pasted them. They're, they're, they're literally the number 12379.22 or whatever, um, or 17%. We've just written these numbers here. And would this be right? Um, as of yesterday, if, if it were on the screen, we showed it to them we, we interactively. And they said, uh, and so this was a way of testing the software. Of course, the software wasn't running yet. It was just a, a blank. It was a, a static page with, with fixed information in it. And they said, oh, yeah, this number is wrong. That number is wrong. Actually, these are right. These are really interesting. Where do you get these? Um, so we had a discussion, but we said, made them up. Don't worry. But then the next time we came back, we came back with uh, corrected information, with one of the, the cells being actually filled from real information. And we said, so this one's real. The others are still fake, but this one is real. And is it meaningful? They said, oh, yeah, except it shouldn't be in that format. It shouldn't be this, and it should be that on Thursdays and whatever. And they talked to us about that. And we kept filling in more and more of it. So that was a way of interactively showing them the information and getting very rapid feedback interactively from them about whether we had the right thing. Don't know if that would have helped Praveen in his case, but um, I just wanted to take, Praveen gave me a great, complex, difficult example there. And I still think that you could test that on customers done carefully. Praveen's example, update the script, um, take the bank down for a day. We don't want that result, but we sure would like that fast feedback loop, which is what I'm gonna talk about next. So let me just uh, take a quick look at what else is here. Whoa, loads of people, boy, so many. Adina, you missed it. I'm gonna be coming to Vienna coming to Vienna probably 20th of October. So uh, no, that'll be exciting for you. Uh, Jez uh, has, um, uh, oh, he has, he was there. Jez, that's Jez, of course, he was there for this bug story. Uh, fantastic. Um, and he says, he thinks it was, he was sitting next to me. That's very possible, Jez. I don't remember fully, but I'm really glad that you're here. So Jez uh, has the same story as me, which is great. Uh, we've got Chris, uh, we've got Simon, uh, Jessica, boy, it's wonderful to see all of you. Uh, I'm going to come back to, to you guys and go back through these, but I, I want to come to the next topic, um, which is actually not one I prepared, but uh, I realize having talked about it, this is crucial. Um, so um, if you if we were all interactive, you could raise your hands and things. I'd ask how many of you um, know how fighter jets work and what makes fighter jets really effective? So have a think about that. The answer comes from a guy, sorry, I didn't prepare his, his name. I think it was Boyd, but uh, forgive me if I got it wrong. The, the key notion, I will put in a comment here and get up on the screen, is the OODA loop. So if you stick that in Google, you will find uh, the OODA loop as the uh, um, uh, has a Wikipedia page and so on. Um, but this OODA loop um, is the thing that this guy, I think it was Boyd, discovered was making um, uh, US, I think it was the US who was better, the US fighter pilots beat the um, uh, uh, pilots in Soviet made um, fighters. Uh, I believe it was Korean War, but I could be wrong. Um, and what he discovered was that the um, uh, American uh, fighter jets had um, glass all the way around. So as you were flying your jet, I'm not very, I don't know much about flying jets, but I, I think it looks like this when you fly a jet and you're flying the jet and uh, you want to look to see where the other bad guy is. And you, you want to look around and you want to be have as much information as possible. And so what they could do is they could look and they could say, oh, the other guy's down there and immediately turn to that direction. 
whereas the Soviet um, folks didn't have as wide, didn't, the canopy was not as clear. So that they, if they wanted to see what was below them, they had to turn the plane, right? So you know, fighter jet, you can turn it upside down, you can turn it all over, but you have to spend extra time in order to discover the other guy has gone below me. Now I need to go down. Oh, wait a minute. Now he's behind me. I have to turn around. You know, there's all kinds of action you have to take rather than just turning your head, right? Which is what the Americans could do. And that was why they had a, an advantage. Forgive me if I'm messing up the details of the story. I could be, it could be Chinese rather than Russian. I, I don't remember in detail. But the point is you want to get around this loop. And that is, let's see if I can remember it. Um, observe, orient, decide, act. And so you think of that as a, a loop going around. Here I am screen sharing, right? So this is enough. I'm sure that you guys can follow. Um, but the key thing was for, in this case, was that they could observe faster. And if you could observe more quickly, then that meant you could get oriented. Ah, okay, I've got a fighter down there and a fighter over there. Wait a minute, I need to take, you know, evasive plan Delta or whatever it is you do in that case, because you have the information that there are two things there. That's the orient part. Decide, okay, I'm going to apply this um, action. I'm going to do this thing and then actually do it, steer the plane in whatever direction. And then, of course, you want to start again. Oh, now I've moved over here. I've discovered a third airplane. I now need to do this other thing. And you can continue around that loop. Now, the point of this is that, um, you, that uh, we should all be trying to get around these loops as fast as humanly possible. That's the thing to be optimizing. How fast am I getting around my OODA loop? Now, of course, you may not need to observe fighter planes in, in your world. I suspect you probably don't. Um, but the, um, let me see if I can get rid of this. There we go. Um, you, you probably don't need to observe fighter planes, but you may need to observe market conditions, customer feedback, customer actions. Do customers buy more when I uh, offer them a two for one? Do they buy less? Uh, are they confused by the offer? Do I want to do something else? That was the kind of question Jez and I were often trying to answer together at that, um, at that website that I mentioned before. Um, in your world, if it's B2B, I'll do uh, Javier's example, uh, it might be that you're uh, trying to figure out whether your partners can fulfill certain contracts, right? Can they fulfill, um, uh, take certain types of orders? Can you uh, offer certain kinds of things in your market? Um, and, and the best way to find out, I mean, you could phone them up and ask them, but that's kind of like having a uh, only part of the canopy, right? Because you have to actually find them, pick up the phone. They have to actually answer. Maybe you have to send them an email. Then you actually find them. You say, can you fulfill this? And they go look in the warehouse and you can, man, that's a mess. Wouldn't it be better if like the fighter jet pilots who had the canopy, they could see all around. If you could just say, hey, this is on the market. Does anybody want to buy it? That makes them then have the, uh, the problem of figuring out, can I meet this? Is this something that I want to buy? Is it a price I'm interested in? And you get much more rapid feedback. And therefore, you can say, oh, well, that price doesn't work. Let me try this. Oh, well, it doesn't work to offer it at this. Maybe I can offer it at that. That would be an example of a B2B um, application of the same idea, where you want to get around that OODA loop as quickly as you can. Uh, another concept I've often talked about here, and uh, go back to some of the recordings on the forum if you're interested in examples. I think we, yeah, we did a whole uh, session on this. Uh, the notion is cycle time. Right? How fast can I get around my cycle um, from uh, the time when I want to try something to the time when I get an answer? So we did a whole uh, live stream, if I remember right, on, on that one. Uh, and it applies here when we're thinking about testing, because if I have to stop and build a whole bunch of tests and then put it into UAT and then get a whole bunch of feedback from loads of people and then uh, take on board all that feedback and go through several sprints of update, I've got clients who, who go through this loop once a year. And that's very painful. <laughs> Right. And that means that compared to their competitors, compared to what their users expect, they're glacial. Right. And they are just not getting the uh, kinds of response, um, uh, uh, speed in the market, uh, opportunity seizing that they would like to have. So the reason why you might want to consider some of the options we're going to talk about in a minute for abandoning tests, not having tests up front, but instead having them in live um, uh, on your customers is mainly that you want to get around this OODA loop faster and therefore you're ahead of the competition. Okay, I'm going to come to some of these uh, questions and, and see if I can deal with those before I go on to sort of the, 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 uh, the next bit here. How do you do this? What does it look like? And I have some more good stories about that. Uh, so we've got Chris and uh, Chris, uh, uh, he said where he's from, Buffalo Grid. Uh, he's busy installing um, uh, uh, tools and software and hardware um, in uh, distant villages in the developing world. So uh, boy, you've got some very complicated users and some complicated situations. What's Chris got to say? Uh, previous job, so before Buffalo Grid, uh, debug logging got left on, production deployment, tried to send a lot of data to a third party log indexing service. <laughs> They agreed to treat it as an honest mistake and not bankrupt us with a bill. Fantastic. So I'd claim that there, 
what you could do is set things up in the same way as where, where I had my team sit, and Jez remembers this, we would sit right next to the customer service people. We designed it that way. You remember, so we'd hear them quickly when there was a problem and we could respond in the same way Chris could say, well, look, we want to be really fast with um, all of our partners. And so we're going to agree with them ahead of time that they will have usage limits, that they will have forgiveness clauses in their contracts. You know, he could get in front of this kind of problem. So then that would allow him not to have to test all the logging and make sure that it wasn't overwhelming someone else's system, but they actually have a rate limit in place to protect him against it. I don't know if that would be important in Jez's situation, but that would be the kind of thing that you could do. Fantastic. I just said Jez. I meant uh, uh, I meant Chris. Apologies. Getting my people. To, it's too many of you. You know, it's hard to keep track of all of you. All right. Fantastic. Uh, we have a different Chris. Uh, uh, back in my days with a consumer lender. Uh, so back to B to C. Uh, we had poorly performing surname search functionality in a homebrew CRM. So uh, uh, I guess he's tracking uh, the people who are getting lending, and he he couldn't find Mr. Smith. Uh, something like that. He wouldn't find people. He would crash when you put in certain wildcard searches all names containing this the letter E. I'm not sure why you would search for all names containing the letter E. That's another question. But um, call center agents used to exploit this bug to get a longer lunch break when the system crashed. See, I claim that was a, a, a bug with a, a minimal impact. Now, obviously, if people are taking longer lunches, that's not so good. But you can detect that. The good thing about that is you can detect it pretty quickly. And if system crashed again, here we go. I wouldn't necessarily fix that bug. Um, maybe I would, maybe if it's causing enough trouble for the call center, I might, but I also, might also say this is a good way to catch people doing stuff they oughtn't, right? Somebody who would do that is um, really up to something. So uh, if this is happening, there, there's something it tells you. So this might be an example of kind of a friendly bug. I don't know if Chris sees it that way, but I don't know how you actually handled it. But again, um, if you can measure the impact of the bug and, and the prospective bug, you know, in, in the other Chris's case, whereas the log, log file, you can say, well, we might get a big bill. Maybe you don't care. Maybe you're VC funded. The big bill isn't that big a deal. You can agree it with the, the vendors ahead of time. Maybe there's something you can do to get in front of it. In, in this case, uh, with the call center, maybe the bug actually tells you something. So it might actually be helpful. If the impact is low, you can apply these tools. So, so let me talk about the kinds of tools you can apply here. So this is the kind of thing you can do that's different from um, just uh, kind of the, the standard, safe, careful things that you might do if you were building that nuclear plant where you have a UAT and you have a beta test period and you have a soaking in period and you have canary cert. There's a whole bunch of things you can do to be super safe. I'm saying consider not doing any of that stuff. What would you do instead? Uh, well, the first thing is to make it really easy to detect when a problem happens. And we've had a couple examples just now. Um, you know, Make sure you have crash logging that tells Chris when his uh, customer service agents are trying to get a longer lunch break. I've got the customer service people in a different case sitting near me so they can shout when the, when the site is down. So early detection is important. Um, just to give you an example of the sort of thing you can do, uh, Etsy, uh, the people who sell the handmade goods, you can buy little crocheted sheep and things. Those guys um, apparently have uh, something that runs every hour that buys an actual product on the site. It goes to a randomly selected seller. It buys a randomly selected crocheted sheep and buys it and actually gives their address and goes through the whole process. It has a credit card attached to it. They spend real money on it. The people actually get it. And they fill a room. <laughs> you could go see it at their office, apparently. Fill a room with all these wonderful things they bought once an hour completely at random. And then they give them away to charity, right? But the advantage is that they can really rapidly detect if there's any kind of problem. It's at most, at most an hour between when, you know, you can't buy things that whose names start with Q and the time when that thing starts to try to buy a, a queen's tiara or something, whatever it is it's, it's getting, and goes beep, certainly can't buy it, something has gone wrong. So early detection can often solve a lot of your problems. Um, and and uh, the other tools are all about um, making sure that you can compare um, uh, the, the, the current state uh, to the old state, right? So you've, you've set something up, you're trying a new thing. How can you make sure you have a control for your experiment? Uh, and so the um, most common one of those that probably most people have heard of is an A-B test. Uh, and that's where you, you release the A and 10% of your users see the A, the new thing that you're trying. And 90% of your users see the B, see the, the old site. You've probably all encountered this. Um, you know, you might go to Facebook and, and you see one way of showing whatever Facebook shows you haven't been there in a while. Um, and, you know, they're showing you the latest feed and the you know, adverts for 
uh, I don't know, um, metaverse, whatever they're doing these days. Um, and somebody else sees it differently. They're seeing it uh, more uh, a different font. They're seeing a different page. They're seeing it laid out differently, different content. Um, and you say, well, how did that happen? Well, you got lucky. You know, you got the new experience and they got the old one or the other way around. That's an A-B test. Um, and uh, those are pretty standard. There are lots of those around. You can do them pretty easily. Um, but there's a lot more you can do. For example, um, there's a technique called uh, uh, feature flags or dark launching. Um, and there's even a product called launch darkly, but you don't have to use that. Um, and that's one where you can release something and specifically pick which users are going to see it. Um, and A-B tests tend to be percentages, but you can actually say, show this only to people um, in the home office um, whose login name has, contains my company name. Well, and you know that you're showing it only to people in your company. Um, you can say only show it to me, right? So just show it to the developer. It's released live. It's live to the world, but it's only going to be turned on for, for people in the company or for you. And then, of course, you can also then turn it on for certain cohorts, right? So you can turn it on for new users. You can turn it on for old users to really know you well, there's lots of ways you can slice and dice it and control it. And the advantage there is though that smaller percentage, it might be bad for them, right? The new thing doesn't work as well for them. You hear the rumbles from customer service. This is where your detection is important. But assuming you have that detection, you're, you're mitigating the impact. You're saying, well, the impact is lower. Man, I don't have to worry about this as much because it's only going to impact 10% of users. Only I will see it. And if it doesn't work, I can't log in. Well, that's bad, but we can fix me. I'm not uh, thousands of users. Exactly the same thing applies, by the way, to B2B situations. Might be much smaller numbers of users. Uh, so some of you might be building software, as I used to do, uh, for um, uh, hedge funds or banks or um, you know big uh, organizations that um, really there's only a handful of users, but it's really valuable to them. Uh, you can still turn it on. You can still launch darkly, um, do uh, kind of controlled feature flag releases to them um, by telling them, hey, we're going to turn this on Monday, but only for this person. Um, you can tell them this is going to show only 10% of the time. Um, you can tell them we're going to turn it on, but for none of you, it's only going to be for us, and we'll come and demo it to you, and we can try it together. Uh, there's lots of ways that you can get the, the code live, therefore getting the OODA loop faster, right? So you're getting the observation, you're taking the action, you're getting the response, you're seeing does this code work, um, and getting the feedback much more quickly, even in cases where you have totally captive and very sensitive users. I can say more about that if that's interesting, but I, I keep coming back to Javier's question, which I think was really good. Okay. Um, let me come to more of your questions. This is great. I see more still flowing in, so I appreciate that. Uh, so I'm going to do a couple more of those and then tell some more stories. So uh, we've got Simon, who says, I uh, heard this one from a QA I worked with. Payroll system being tested ended up spewing out production data for all to see. CTO earned his nickname 2K. Ah, I see. So they could see what the CTO's uh, day rate was. Okay. So I claim also that this is um, a relatively low impact bug. Now, it may be that in your case, it you know, really put off the CTO. That, if the CTO quits, that, that could be bad. Um, but this is internal, right? So this is not affecting your users. This is, inter this is um, uh, affecting people within the, the, the company. Um, but maybe actually, oh, maybe I'm misunderstanding it. Maybe this is a payroll system provided by somebody else. That would be pretty bad. This is an impact you don't want. I'm sorry, if this is a third-party payroll system, yes, you, you would not want it publishing the salaries to everyone. That's usually a big no-no, GDPR, everything else is uh, violated. So I would uh, look for ways to launch darkly there, but with much more protections. And we'll talk more about uh, some of those if you want to. Let's see, we've got Jess, uh, engineering manager for a team, release software to uh, manage a bulk salary increase for our largest client. Increasing 20,000, hey, this sounds great, make everybody really happy. Small issue, localization problems means the dots and the commas got switched around. So actually, instead instead of increasing from 20K to 30K, I assume that you uh, increased increased from 20K to 30, right? So that would be not quite so good. Uh, my, my salary were 30 pounds a year. Instead of 20,000, I might be quite sad. Uh, yeah, rather than getting the 50% increase I was expecting. Um, so that sounds actually very similar to the one Jess and I had. So the, the story that I started with, Jess. So thank you for that. Um, and uh, again, in, in this case, um, it seems to me that you could definitely limit the impact of that. First of all, it's undoable. I'm sure that um, you, you didn't actually allow the... Um, uh, the people to receive checks for 30, 30 pounds or 30K when they shouldn't get it or whatever. Um, so there was some um, uh, sort of leavening in the process. There was some way it was decoupled. Your 
pro process of software didn't result in people actually getting the money. Um, and if it did, it would be good to create that decoupling so that um, uh, you might notify people and be embarrassing, but it wouldn't cause them to actually receive money. And also this, this sounds like it was internal. So uh, agree, this is not so good. We'd like to avoid this, but it's the sort of thing it sounds like you could correct quickly. So uh, if you set up the plan for it, you're actually getting very rapid feedback. Hey, this didn't work. We didn't take account of commas and full stops. Sounds important. Adina says, hi from Vienna. Looks like I'm going to get to come see you soon, which is great. D, uh, I'm not sure who D is. Uh, I just get the initials. Worked on a taxi scheduling system. Code was supposed to schedule a pickup every day at the same time for two years. Wow, what a good deal. <laughs> but it scheduled them all on the same day. So 500 taxis went to a rural location all at 1 a.m. Okay, that's an example of a high-impact bug, right? We don't want that to happen. However, it sure seems to me that um, you could limit the impact of that in lots of ways by um, having the, the, the new system, the thing that was supposed to do the pickup, for example, whatever you were changing, um, uh, only affect, say, the next week. Then you might send only seven taxis. That would be a, a lower impact. Um, you could also uh, do things to detect it more quickly so that if, if you started dispatching 500, there could be a little alarm that says, hey, hang on, we're about to, just like there was an alarm, there's something that told, I should have mentioned this before, there was something that told the customer service people and the CFO, um, uh, I'm gesturing behind me because he sat back there and, and he marched up to us, um, but there was something that alerted them to tell them about any anomalous purchases. If somebody had tried to buy 100 Louis Vuitton handbags, we'd be worried, you know, fencing stolen goods or some other kind of thing. There's some crazy thing going on, we would get alerted. Also, if they bought it for a lot less, something was funny was going on. So they were watching and they saw this. Similarly, your dispatcher could pick this up and say, uh, 500, uh, maybe we shouldn't be sending all of those. Let's do something. Even at one in the morning, the system could have phoned them. So those kinds of checks are the sort of thing that you could invest in differently. So you invest in those instead of in tests. The advantage is that, of course, you get benefits in production, right? So if some human accidentally books 500, and it's not the system has a bug, but a human screws up, you also still don't want to send 500 taxis. That doesn't sound like a good idea. You're going to clog the roads. Uh, not so good. But D, that was a fantastic uh, example. Really appreciate the, the example. Good stuff. Um, so let me move on to a, a couple more stories just to kind of inspire you. And then uh, please fire in more questions. So, so far we have great examples, um, not so many questions. So wh where can I answer for you? I'm going to tell all these stories and say, go forth, get your OODA loop up, um, release things to production, um, try them out and get feedback. Um, and, and here's some methods. But I'd love more questions. Challenge me more. Argue with me if you think I'm not right. Um, but let me tell uh, at least uh, one more story. Um, and that's about a company that uh, you might think was in the nuclear plant category. And this company built something that was kind of almost a medical device. Uh, I found out in the process of looking into this um, and helping them improve that it, it was kind of just as about as close to a medical device as you could be without being legally um, obligated to be, you know, like a pacemaker in your heart. It was that kind of thing uh, that it had very serious consequences if this thing went wrong. And, and I got that really hammered home to me one day when I was uh, saying, oh, yes, what we can do is speed ourselves up. In the biotech world, um, you know, I often talk about we should release new code every day. These guys were releasing every six months, and that was cutting edge. Right? This was really new and exciting, and like every six months was pretty good. Salespeople were tearing their hair out, right? It was just the worst thing ever for them. Uh, but the engineers said, look, we have to be really careful here. Squirrel, you have these crazy ideas. Elephant Carpaccio and your other nutty no notions about how you can release software faster and get around the OODA loop. No, we are not interested in that. What are you doing? Because the problem is that if we release the wrong thing, if we um, put out this uh, device in, in, with the wrong configuration, then the tests that it runs might cause people to cut off parts of their bodies. And we wouldn't want them to cut off the wrong part or a part that they shouldn't cut off, right? That would be really bad. So you know, if you're gonna go around and, and remove some, you know, have some operation to have something uh, removed, you, you kind of want to make sure you're right about that. And that really got my attention. I said, boy, I, I don't want to be part of that. I'd be sure be sad if I had to talk to a user of this software uh, who, who had been misled, right? That is a, a definition, classic definition of a very high impact bug worse than any of the you know, 500 taxis and, and um, bank shutdown for a day that we've had so far. So I said, boy, I better find out about this. So I went to see the appropriate people and those people were in the compliance department and their job was to make sure we didn't do anything stupid that caused people to cut off parts of their bodies or get the wrong results or panic or, or some other horrible thing if we gave them the wrong results from the test we were running. 
And what I found was a very interesting thing. The compliance people said, first of all, uh, we think we're doing the right kind of thing and we could go faster. We just need to document really, really carefully. So we need to be able to prove we've done all the things we said we would, that we've done all the kinds of internal checks we need to, but we are not the bottleneck. That's what these guys were telling you. The engineers thought, you know, can't get it past compliance. I have to spend months testing everything. Compliance said, actually, you don't have to. And I said, but wait, what about cutting parts of people's bodies off? What not this a problem? And, and the, what the compliance people said was, well, actually, the way it's really used in the real world is there's a gold standard device. And that's really tested in a very different way. That is like the nuclear plant. That, that object, and that's been used for years and years and years. Everyone knows it. It's just bloody expensive and painful. Right? You have to go through a lot to use it. It's uh, inconvenient for the patient, hurts the patient, um, and, and takes forever to get done. Ours is like super fast. You don't have to do very much. You just get an instant result, and it's much, much better. So anytime people get a result from us, they check it with the gold standard one. But it saves loads of people from having to do that because we give them the, the peace of mind that they don't have to worry about. The, the problem that we might have created was that we give them a false positive. We give them a, a, a result. They had the disease. They had the problem. Um, so we weren't read about a false negative that would clear them. Uh, so they said, look, you could go much faster. This would be perfectly fine with us. All you have to do is make sure you document very carefully, which is exactly what we did. And we then moved to totally state-of-the-art, really cutting edge. And they now release their new software every two weeks. This makes sales very happy, lets them respond to customers. They get around their OODA loop. Um, and yes, they have bugs. Yes, there are problems. And they correct them very quickly because, of course, it's only two weeks until the next release in their world. That's incredibly fast, right? So hospitals and people who are using their medical device are just ecstatic about how quick it is. And they know that if there was ever a problem, they'd be using that gold standard device. So that's an example of um, having some mitigation factor in place, uh, not unlike some of the examples we've just talked about where um, not only can you have detection in place, but you have some form of mitigation. Um, an A-B test was one, uh, a dark uh, launching uh, um, uh, with a feature flag is one to reduce the impact, so a smaller number of people. Here's a case where you can mitigate by having another check, another activity, something else that then keeps you safe. And if it did go wrong here, at least you also have something over there. Uh, so that's another method. Um, and if they can apply it in biotech, I really think you guys can, because most of you are not in anything that, that is that um, that consequential. Right. Simon asks a question. Fantastic. I want to answer Simon's question. Hi, Simon, by the way. Good to see you. Um, what if what if we have a monthly release cadence? I know. I know. Yes, Simon. Why not every day? I have a bet on my website. I'll just go into this in case Simon wants to win a beer from me. Um, I have a bet on my website that I can take any um, feature, anything that you might like to build that you think is really hard and that you think you can't do in little pieces, each of which goes out, each of which is tested on customers, each of which gives you feedback. So you can get around your OODA loop every day. Now, in the biotech case, th there were really good reasons not to do that. Every two weeks was pretty good for them. Um, but uh, I claim on my website that I can take anything that I can uh, take anything you give me and um, tell you how you could do it every day if you chose to. Um, so, Simon, if you want to um, take me up on that, if anybody else wants to, just write to me. Go to DouglasSquirrel.com. You'll, you'll find the bet. If you can't find it, just write to me and tell me your hardest case. Uh, I would love to uh, tell you why you're wrong or tell you why at least I think uh, you could release that every day. The, the prize is a beer if you can really stump me. No one has ever stumped me. So you could be the first one. All right. Sorry. Let me get to Simon's question. Sorry. I just got distracted. The lead time in fixing a bug our customer has found could be a deal breaker. Yeah, that's because you're releasing every month. That's the problem. What we ought to be doing is mitigating the uh, impact. So the way to mitigate the impact, first most obvious one, is release much more frequently. Now, your customer might find that painful. I have the feeling you might be in uh, B2B. I'm not sure of this, Simon. But, um, and I hope I'm giving Javier enough uh, examples of B2B. But your, um, uh, your customer might, not might not, but they might, say, all right, fine. We'll let you uh, send um, a certain part of this set of requests, maybe the less urgent ones or the less dangerous ones. Those can go over here to a uh, part of your service that is updated more frequently. Or they might say, OK, fine, we'll let you update more frequently when it's urgent. Right? We'll, we'll give you permission for that. Simon says, yep, OK, I assume he means he's, yep, he's um, in the B2B uh, world. So he's dealing with a, a customer who might be a gatekeeper for him, saying, no, you can't release that quickly. Um, uh, but the customer may be more willing to consider something different than you think they are. 
Um, so that's one option. I would certainly be exploring with that customer. Wouldn't you like us to get around this OODA loop faster? Wouldn't you like to get the new features quicker? Wouldn't you like to be able to see them, comment on them, and, and deal with them in a safe way? And that's the mitigation piece. So if anything's coming through here, I hope that, that what I'm emphasizing is you should have detection and mitigation. And Simon, I'm confident that uh, you're skilled enough that you could do the detection well. You might need to um, discuss with your customer and design with them, jointly design the mitigation side. What kind of mitigations could you do? What if they absolutely anticipate a possible question from Simon or someone else? What if that customer just is recalcitrant? They just say, absolutely not, no way. You're never releasing more than once a month to us. In fact, we'd prefer you did it once a quarter. You should slow down. We want you to do it less often. One thing you could do is introduce that customer to me because I will go tell them why their strategy is uh, has head inserted in hindquarters. So um, there's something really wrong with that customer. But assuming you can't make that change, you can't get me in there quickly enough to tell them they're, uh, they're, they've uh, done something wrong. What could you do there? You still could do the kind of thing that I was describing before with the um, customer who had the very long spreadsheet, right? Uh, I said they were going to Excel. They had uh, column X, X, Y, Q. We tried to replace it. And we took things to them individually and we showed them to them. So uh, that was a completely safe environment. They weren't actually trading using our software yet. But we could show them the software running live and we could gradually replace faked data with real data. And they could gradually say this is better. In fact, what they did is they tore it out of our hands at one point. And they said, man, this is so great. We want this. All right, how do we sign on? What was that URL? And they were looking in the browser and figuring out where to go. And they're saying, wait, <laughs> some of these numbers are still fake. They said, we don't care. We want to use it. Uh, it's so much better than what we've got. So um, you, you could try that sort of thing if your customer is absolutely recalcitrant, that you have supervised testing, that you have supervised feedback from users. Not as good, harder to do, more investment, um, but still possible. Simon, I hope that was helpful. Feel free to, uh, to ask again um, if, if I haven't covered everything there. Um, one more appeal for more questions. I would love to hear more from any of you. This is great. You guys have wonderful examples. I've had a lot of fun with these, um, but I'd love more examples, more argument, more challenging um, situations. Um, uh, let me give you my final story. Uh, today's been a story day, which I'm, I'm having fun with. And if I'm having fun, that's all that matters, really. Um, but uh, the um, that story I want to tell you is about a customer of mine. Um, you probably could figure out who they are, but I, I don't think it's uh, it's too secret. Um, they they uh, deal with houses. So uh, they were helping people uh, with the sale of their houses. And uh, so one of the things they had to do, and this is pre-pandemic, by the way, uh, I don't know how people sell houses today, um, but um, it was kind of the idea of a video tour was really quite new. That wasn't something people had really thought about very much yet. And so um, they were having people who were essentially estate agents who worked for them, uh, who had, you know, rings and rings of keys and uh, would go and pick the right one and drive over to number 12 Maple uh, uh, Court or whatever and uh, unlock the door and let people walk around and look at the house the way you do when, when you buy a house. And this was very expensive. And they said, man, this is killing us. We, we really want to do something better. But we, uh, the investment in creating video tours, which is something they thought might help them with this cost, um, seemed really high. So they said, man, we're not sure how, how we want to uh, get feedback on this. We're kind of stuck. And I've been beating it into them that they could get much more rapid feedback from their customers. They didn't have to test as thoroughly. They didn't have to go through quite as much effort. And they took it to the nth degree. So what they did without telling me, I was just excited when they told me the story after, um, is they got a list of all the people who were booked for, um, uh, for a set of tours. So all the people who were going to have tours in the next few days. They got that list and they got a list of all their mobile numbers and they texted them all uh, a, a text. And the text said this, would you like to try a video tour before you go see 123 Maple Court or wherever it was? Um, if you would click here. And uh, so um, they, they measured how many people clicked the button. That all seems pretty normal. What's different about that squirrel? Uh, when you hit the button, nothing happened. So they had not built the, the page that the button led to. In fact, it was a 404 for those of you who know the, the web code for you know, this page does not exist. So you clicked it, you got an error. And they did that on purpose. Um, but what they did have was something that detected when people tapped the button. So there was enough of a response that they could say, yeah, people click this. And they found 80% of the people clicked. And they said, aha, people would like video tours. Now you might then, so, so the detection there was very clear. <laughs> they could detect people want video tours. That, they had that covered. The mitigation was very creative, I thought. What they did is they gave the customer service people a script. And these customer service people had to phone anyway to say, you know, your tour is at this time and your person is uh, Douglas and they're going to come at four o'clock and so on. Make sure you go there. Don't be late. Um, and and uh, they were phoning anyway. 
So they had a little script and they said, hey, by the way, did you try the video tour? And Mr. Jones or whoever it was would say, uh, well, yeah, I did, but it didn't work. And they said, oh, we're so sorry. Yeah, it wasn't working on Thursday. It wasn't working on Thursday. It wasn't working any day. They hadn't built it. But in fact, what they got there was a way to mitigate the impact. And they said, oh, we're so sorry, but you're going to see the place anyway. And we'll see you on Saturday. You know, looking forward to it. Nobody was, uh, noses were put out of joint. No users were impacted massively. Nobody had to shut down the bank or, uh, you know, melt down the nuclear plant. Um, but the result was they learned very quickly, got around the OODA loop nearly instantly at the cost of a little script that sent a bunch of text messages and so a little training for the customer service people. And they then built video tours, which were very successful. So uh, the point of this story is um, there are lots of ways uh, to, to find mitigation. And if you're creative enough, you can almost always find something that'll allow you to really minimize the testing you do beforehand and to get a lot of information and mitigate um, once you're live. Uh, Javier is there. He says, maybe I'm late with this question. Uh, I thought it was coming. Uh, uh, what happens after going live and how do you view tests to decrease feedback lead time as part of continuous integration? Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, well, I've, I've talked a lot about kind of the product side of how you might do this. Um, I think Javier is asking about kind of the engineering side. What happens after you go live? What happens is you turn on your detection mechanism. In the case of these folks with the um, uh, with the house tours, um, they looked at the number of people who were clicking on the on the button. They expected them all to get errors, right? So that's kind of an extreme case. Um, in, in the case where Jez and I were releasing new software and we didn't have any tests, um, uh, we had a, a great big red button. I don't think I've talked about the red button yet. Yeah, I did. I talked about it at the beginning. Apologies. Sorry. You gave me a bad moment there, Javier. Um, we had the great big red button and we would push it as soon as we heard from customer service. That was our detection mechanism. So what happens after you go live is you go live fearlessly and you say, okay, I'm going to watch my detection mechanism. Um, how do you view tests to decrease feedback lead time as part of CI? You don't. So what you don't do in this model is build a whole bunch of tests which run in CI. Now, I'm a beautiful, I'm a fan of tests. I think they're beautiful and wonderful, and you should absolutely write tests as part of your coding. I'm not saying throw away all your tests, but I'm saying you don't have to wait for your tests. You don't have to build a UAT environment and test with your customers and check things 17 ways and take it to compliance and all those sorts of things. The stories that I've told and the examples that we've talked about are all about how you can short circuit that. So I'm expecting that you'll still run your tests and you'll still have them in continuous integration. You'll still look at them and you'll still see them. The problem is all of these bugs probably came about, certainly the ones I've been describing, the ones that are actually bugs, they came about despite the fact that people had tests, right? They had internal tests. They had um, QA people doing manual tests. They had automated tests and the bugs still got through. That's the kind of the dirty secret of testing. And what I'm suggesting here is that you can emphasize less your internal testing, your protection, your insurance, and do more to reduce the impact and more to detect the problem. Uh, I hope that's helpful. Javier, if it's not what you were looking at. Okay, Javier says that makes sense. Okay, good to hear it. Right. Uh, I don't see any other questions. Um, I've had a blast. This is lots of fun for me. Um, if you'd like to come along to any of uh, the further exam uh, tests here, um, uh, items here, tests, now I've got tests on the brain, um, uh, any of the further events that I've mentioned before. So we have one on why estimates are things you can throw away, never do any more estimates. We have one on why ambiguous requirements, ambiguity is a real opportunity. I forgot to mention, Laura's going to kill me. Um, we have uh, an, a live event in London on the 8th of September, and that's all about using techniques from improv theater to say yes to all the requests you get. So um, uh, if you'd like to come to any of those, uh, uh, let's see if I can actually spell here. Uh, it's squirrelsquadron.com. These are all free. Um, I'm never selling anything. Uh, uh, this is not my goal. My goal is to give back and to make sure that people learn about all these important ideas. I'm going to get this up on the screen for you. So um, head on over there, uh, sign up to the squadron. I send a weekly email with uh, uh, kind of challenging new ideas. Um, we have the weekly events. We have the forum to comment on. Uh, lots going on. And as I mentioned before, um, I'm going to be in London on the 8th of September. I'm going to be in Vienna, I believe, on the 20th of October, still for finalizing that, um, Berlin in late September, and Miami in early November. So um, come see me in person as well, which I'd certainly be excited to do. Okay. Thank you, everybody. This has been a blast. Really enjoyed your stories and your questions. Please bring more, as always, and uh, I'll see you at the next event. Have a wonderful day.